Okay, that was only 22 seconds, but um, thank you all for coming to the last plenary session for PCORA 20. Um, and we're gonna, before we get to the, the main plenary today, we have a special presentation um, this year, and I'll let Amy Budge from University of New Mexico explain it, but um, we're gonna give out the presentation of the PCORA Symposium Student Competition Poster Awards. And the significance of posters, there also is a student competition for papers, but they are still going on for the next session. So we're only giving out the poster award for this session. And so without further ado, let's just get right into that. Amy? Tom is taller than me. Okay, um, but first of all, I would like to thank the team of judges. We had quite a few judges involved in this uh, process for the student competition awards for both posters and papers. And as Tom mentioned, we're only uh, gonna be awarding, um, or giving out the awards for the posters. That session was held with the exhibit um, reception a few nights ago. We had uh, 10 posters that were evaluated and they were scored. We had three judges uh, per poster looking at them. And they came up with their uh, numbers and we count, uh, ta tabulated those and have three uh, awardees. I also would like to thank the students, all of the students who have been participating in this process. It's the first time the PCORA uh, conference has ever held a student competition for papers, best papers and posters. Uh, one of the questions that came up was, okay, uh, what kind of award are we gonna give? And the New Mexico Geographic Information Council um, and its nonprofit incorporated group in New Mexico uh, stepped up to the challenge and is offering the monetary award. So we have uh, them to thank. Um, I was on the board for a number of years, so I kind of twisted their arm a little bit, but they, they stepped up very quickly. Uh, it is a one-time award. Uh, I, if the Cora in the future would like to do this, uh, that's yet to be determined. Uh, the idea of the award is to uh, encourage students to uh, pursue careers in geospatial sciences and uh, technologies and applications and to develop uh, expertise coming to uh, conferences like this and others around the nation, some of them globally as well, uh, to develop their careers. Uh, the award is given, uh, this award at this conference is giving to outstanding uh, posters and, and um, uh, papers, and they there are two categories, the posters and papers. Uh, there's three awards. The first place uh, is worth $300. Uh, the second place is $150, and third place is $75, and that's for, for both categories. Um, the criteria for evaluating the awards uh, basically was the relevance of the topic that the student has for either the paper or the poster, and the relevance uh, in uh, that it has for uh, geospatial technologies, including remote sensing, image processing, modeling, uh, applications, even education. Uh, the other uh, uh, criteria was the quality of the presentation, uh, the oral presentation. If there were more than one author for either of the posters or papers, it was the person who was giving it orally uh, that was being evaluated. So how well did they do, or the graphics on the posters, uh, clearly uh, legible, could you understand what the uh, person was saying? And those were the things that they were being evaluated against. Um, Tom did mention that the papers, uh, we don't have uh, those selected yet because two sessions are gonna be going on after the plenary today, and we have some students participating in those sessions, so we'll have to evaluate uh, all of those later, and they will get their awards uh, mailed later on. So without any further ado, since we do have a time limit here, I, uh, we have the winners. And the first place uh, goes to Jill Derwin for a poster. Jill, are you in the audience? Okay, uh, second place goes to, and I'm not sure I'm gonna say the name correctly, Lon Nugun, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. 
Sorry if I mutilated your name. <laughs> and third place goes to Yeni Vetrita. Yeni, are you in the audience? And with that, uh, that concludes the awards. If we would uh, please congratulate again the winners. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to the last plenary of PCORA 20. Uh, this session is our look to the future. The uh, title of the session is New Breakthroughs in Earth Observations and Applications, and we're going to approach this subject uh, as a panel. Uh, initially, uh, we, I will introduce the panelists who will give some overview remarks. The four that we'll be presenting uh, will each go through that process and then at the end we'll open it up for questions. What we're going to try to do in this is to listen to a diverse group of, of researchers um, from a variety of uh, perspectives and backgrounds uh, and get their, uh, their perspectives on what the current challenges in our field are, what the emerging opportunities are, and finally what their, their views are of the necessary or desired future breakthroughs. And so let's move to the uh, first panelist. And so I'd like to uh, invite um, Dr. David Lari to, this, to the podium and he will lead off. Um, Dr. Lari is a professor from the University of Texas at Dallas uh, and is the director for the Center for Multiscale Intelligent Integrated Interactive Remote Sensing or Space Studies. Uh, he has a PhD in photochemical computer modeling of atmospheric chemistry from the University of Cambridge. And his research theme is in physics uh, in service of society. And so with that, I'll turn it over. Okay, sorry about that little delay there. So I'm really excited to share with you a brief overview of several case studies that I've been involved with over the last 30 years. And the theme going through all of this is basically bringing together remote sensing, uh, which is, a, I guess, applied physics, and machine learning for various societal applications. So I'm going to start out with like a story. So what the first... Thing that I think we should know about machine learning is machine learning is something we use when we don't have a perfect theory. Because if we had a perfect theory, we would be using it. So it's for all those other cases, which in my experience has been a very large fraction of the cases, when we don't have a perfect understanding. And it's also very useful for bringing together data from multiple sources. Um, so my first introduction to it was for a very intractable problem that I was facing. I was involved with satellite validation, and we were into comparing different satellites. And unfortunately, we found that they weren't agreeing to within their quoted uncertainties. So if we're wanting to fuse this data to give us a long-term record, fusing biased data is a very bad idea. But how do you exactly characterize those biases? How, in an automated way, can you cross-calibrate multiple satellites? Because every satellite has a finite life, is going to die, another one's going to take over from it. So this is quite a ubiquitous problem. And in trying to solve this, I quite by chance came across machine learning. 
And I thought, wow, I wish someone had told me about this before. This is really cool. And the more I tried it out, the more I found it was useful. So I, I'm hoping to give you a, a flavor for that. But each of them will be like a story. So this first one shows why we were wanting to do that satellite cross calibration. So my PhD thesis was the first global model of ozone depletion. And a key thing in doing modeling of ozone depletion is the total amount of reactive halogens. The trouble is, we don't really have measurements that are comprehensively characterizing the total amount of reactive halogens. We have some of the components that we need to sum together. The trouble is, even those components we do have, when we intercompare them, they don't always agree to the uncertainty. So we have two issues. One, one, we're not measuring directly what we want to. And secondly, the direct measurements we do have of a subpart are often biased relative to each other. So the net result of that is sort of illustrated on this slide. So this is from an international assessment of ozone depletion. The multiple lines that you see are various models showing their time evolution over time. And then on the left panel, you see those two points with error bars, which were the only observations they had to calibrate and sift the wheat from the chaff in these different simulations. So, that was actually uh, not so great. We would really want a continuous time series of this. So using the machine learning actually let us do that. So um, to try and illustrate the problem, what I show you here is multiple satellites observing the same volume of space. And I plotted histograms of the distribution of their observations. So in an ideal world, all these histograms should overlay each other. But you see, they don't. Um, so that is basically the problem. So if we now do a scatter diagram of one instrument against the other, we would ideally want a straight line diagram with a slope of one and an intercept of zero. But as you can see, when we plot several of these, that's not what we get. So I'm showing you several pairs here. Now, on the right-hand side is what happened after we cross-calibrated them using the machine learning. You see that we've straightened it out. Now the slope is 1, the intercept is 0. So that was my first encounter with the machine learning. But it didn't really stop there. Um, if we now, um, what I was showing you was one component. But remember, I said we really want um, the full picture, which we're not measuring. So what I was able to use the machine learning to do in a second step was the mapping from what we were observing to what we really wanted to know. And uh, actually, I've, this is an easier figure to show. And the range of uncertainty is because, you remember, I said there were biases between the different instruments. Now, the shaded region in each case represents that inter-instrument bias. So if we then overlay our initial plot where we just had the two data points, now we have a continuous uh, time series that we can sift the wheat from the chaff, to use that earlier expression. So the machine learning helped us with two very challenging steps that otherwise would have been very difficult to do. Now, a similar thing is shown here. On the left and the right, you have two satellites products for exactly the same thing. It's a vegetation index. And the World Bank uses this to decide when to give food aid to people. So, um, but as you see, the two instruments <laughs> measuring for the same month have totally different values. But again, by using the machine learning, we were able to cross calibrate them. And um, the one on the left shows the difference, and the one on the right is recalibrating the first instrument like the second instrument. So the, the right-hand column, now they look almost identical. So that is um, basically, again, doing the same thing for different products. Another area we've been using it is to look at air quality. So in this case, we've been going from the global scale measurements also to the very local scale. And we've been using machine learning both in creating new data products for the real-time analysis of the inter-instrument biases and, and then bringing together this fusion of a very large number of observations from satellites to ground stations and to inexpensive sensors we can distribute across the cities and observations from aerial vehicles. So the reason this is important uh, as just an example is right now in the US alone, there's about um, 50 million people with allergic diseases. 26 million people have asthma. And that leads to 
on average, every day, 44,000 people are having an asthma attack. So if we could have some timely information on the abundance of airborne particulates or pollen, that could use, uh, be used for timely alerts, for schools deciding if they're going to have physical exercise outside or inside, which in fact is already beginning to be done and yielding very good uh, results. So on a global scale, it's even bigger, with 7 million deaths being attributed to air pollution in just 2012 alone. So we can then use the machine learning to go a few steps further and bring together many types of different data for which we definitely don't have a theory that's complete linking them together, from the bioinformatics, from the medical informatics with electronic health records, and um, the environmental observations from sensors like we just saw. So to give you a bit of an insight into this, these little airborne particulates we're trying to measure are shown on the right-hand side as that little speck. They're two and a half microns in diameter and less. And on the, the left-hand side, you see a human hair. So you can see these are so tiny that you can get many of them across a human hair. So, um, the EPA have a few roadside stations that measure these, but give us far less coverage than ideally we would want. Yet the satellites don't measure them directly. We measure a total integrated optical depth of um, aerosol extinction. So we again can find the machine learning very useful to bring together these disparate types of data. So just to give you a whirlwind tour of that, on the bottom there, you see a picture of one of these type of roadside stations. And in the map above it, every red square outlined in black is one of 8,000 sites in 55 countries where this is measuring out, measured hourly. So what we did is we used the machine learning to learn the mapping from the ubiquitously available remote sensing data, meteorological data, population and density, et cetera, to what these um, individual stations were measuring, and with very good uh, success, in fact. So the data was coming from a variety of sources, and then we were able to produce this map as an example. So this is the average of more than 6,000 um, maps done on, from August 1997 to the present. So when you compare this to actually what the in situ measurements were, they were actually rather good. And then we've also done this on the very local scale. So this is one pixel where we drove a car around. So this is a 10 by 10 kilometer pixel where we measure every second, which really is a resolution of less than a meter. And you can see the very local scale variability. So that's again why we're trying to take this approach, because we can take from the global scale observations to the very hyper-local ones to give us um, insights. So this is a picture of some of our aerial vehicles. We're also trying to do this for pollen. Um, and here is one of our set of observations that we make every 10 seconds of the full size distribution. So the reason I'm showing you this is to emphasize the very local temporal and spatial variability. So being able to merge these multiple data sets with the aid um, of machine learning is incredibly valuable. And we want to use it to drive a virtual human, so this avatar of Ben, a 12-year-old who loves sports. The idea is it can be a, a child of any gender or ethnicity, but their appearance changes in response to the real-time measurement. So as the pollen and particulates level go up, his eyes start to water, and you can see a zoom-in view inside him, and you see his lungs, uh, his airways constricting, and so on. Um, so. And the other thing is that when you have this prevalent uh, data and you start to compare it to things like hospital admissions, you start to realize there's, there's a wider variety of health outcomes that are being affected by the, the, the pollution than we would first think. Um, so you can then recursively use the machine learning, both for producing the analyses and then looking at the health outcomes as a function of the environmental context to give you, say, predictions for what, um, how many staff you'll need, what supplies you're likely to need, to give timely alerts to people with certain um, health conditions, and so on. So um, 
I'm running out of time rapidly, so I just wanted to show you a few other ideas. So we've also been able to characterize in an automated way pretty much all the dust sources on the planet. And that was using another type of machine learning called unsupervised learning. So what's unique about these dust sources is that they're often really hyper-localized. And so what is the difference between the surface pixel that is a dust source and its neighbor that isn't? So on the right-hand side, you see we've classified all surface pixels on the planet into a 1,000 different classes, uh, objectively using the spectral signature. And it turns out just 15 of those correspond to different dust sources. And this led to a great improvement in the forecast uh, quality. So um, I'll skip through that quickly. Now, um, this is uh, an example of this. So I didn't even realize there were salt flats um, in South America, but this is a satellite image of one of those salt flats. And the blue areas were the areas of the machine learning automatically identified as the dust sources. And what you notice is they're exactly at the head of the plumes, which was so amazing. It basically didn't expect it to do such a good job as that. Um, so the future directions of this is partly a, a very large array of new data products. So here you can see some of our ocean products done using this approach. But then to actually bring the machine learning into uh, an embedded nature. So for example, NVIDIA have a credit card size processor with 256 GPUs that you could easily fly on an aerial vehicle or a satellite. So we can then have onboard processing and the real-time streaming of these products, which can drastically reduce the data volume required and so the bandwidth. And this can be also achieved by using robotic teams. So you have uh, a boat um, going, a robotic boat, which is teaming with an overflying uh, aerial vehicle with a hyperspectral imager. And so it's a coordinated team collecting its training data. Then once it's been trained, it can just stream that data and periodically collect new training data to check um, that we are doing a comprehensive training. So another thing we're hoping to use this for is for oil spill thickness estimation. So one of the big issues after Deepwater Horizon was the timely information to exactly where the oil is. Because from the bridge of the ship, the cleanup ships, you can't see the oil. So normally, you have an aerial spotter from a helicopter that looks down and says, oh, I think that's where the thickest oil is based on the color of the water. But by the time the ship gets there, because the ship moves rather slowly, the, the, <laughs> the oil has moved. Um, so this would give us a real time eyes in the sky where we turn the hyperspectral imaging with the machine learning into an oil thickness. Um, and then you, the ship goes straight to that. And then we're also going one level further with the air quality one. So, so we have the global scale of satellite data, then the local scale from these real-time sensors. And then we're looking at the effect on the cyclist. So this cyclist you see there has a full EEG uh, network of 64 electrodes on his head. He's wearing um, heart rate variability tracking. He has eye tracking glasses, which is looking at the pupil dilation of his eyes. Then the data is analyzed in 10 second epochs. And we, we look at the composition of the air, absolutely everything up to an atomic mass of 500, all particulates from 10 nanometers to 100 microns in something like 200 size bins. And so we have the physical stimulus. We see the physiological response to try and learn um, what mapping given uh, physical pollutants have on the human outcome. So you can begin to see this can be done for many different applications, but in all of them, the machine learning is indispensable, both to give our data a voice and to build the empirical models when we don't have perfect theory. So um, thanks for bearing with me in that. And I guess it's the next person. Um, it takes a number of people to uh, bring up PowerPoint slides. Um, our next presenter uh, is Dr. Valerie Pasquarella 
from the uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she is with the Department of Interior's N Northeastern Climate Science Center, and she's affiliated also with the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, Val has a PhD in remote sensing from Boston University and is, um, was a member of Curtis Woodcock's time series remote sensing team. Uh, her research focuses on remote sensing in ecology and in particular the role of long time series in understanding ecological issues. Valerie. Hi everyone. So when Tom asked us to speak about current challenges, emerging opportunities, and desired future breakthroughs, I took a little bit of a different perspective. We've heard a lot about data and technology in the sessions over the last few days, um, but I'm going to focus a lot more on our community and applications. Uh, so to begin with the current challenges, anyone who's worked closely with me knows that I'm incredibly passionate about education. And I think one of our greatest challenges that we're facing today is how to train our next generation of remote sensing scientists. We have more sensors, more data, higher spatial, spectral, and temporal resolution than we've ever had at any time in the past. And working with this data is really a huge challenge. So our students not only have to master their data streams, they also have to become proficient coders. Code is more a part of our science than I think it ever has been before. And so I think our challenge going forward is really looking at remote sensing as a CS plus X problem. So some of you may have heard of these degrees. They're becoming more popular at universities like the UC California system and University of Illinois, where essentially you're trained in both computer science and a domain specific topic. So you're going to look at, in my case, computer science plus ecology. Uh, we might think back to William Pecora as a geologist that he was dealing with both image processing and his topic of geology. So our students really need to be both proficient coders and experts in a topic area. And I think embracing that challenge, programs like America View um, and a lot of other education-centric programs are going to be really critical in helping us have these students be the future of remote sensing and be really competent uh, messengers for our science. When it comes to emerging opportunities, Tom said, I work with time series of Landsat data, although I think this is probably more broadly applicable to other sensors. Um, as Curtis said in his plenary yesterday, Landsat time series are perhaps the most valuable environmental record that we have. Uh, and as we're making this shift from image processing to what I think of as really data-driven landscape modeling, uh, we really need to embrace our opportunities to think like ecologists. Uh, we've gotten really good at really big, obvious changes, shifts from forest to development, those abrupt, you know, what you're looking at. You would have known it from a before-after change detection exercise. But there's so much more to these time series signals. And so the time series that I have up here, uh, how I like to look at my data, color-coded by season. This is a greenness time series for a forest in New England. And so there's some really obvious things here, like seasonality. Uh, but there's also a lot of... A lot of what we would, might think of as noise in the signal, but when you're really thinking like a systems ecologist, that noise has value. Uh, we've got work going on our lab relating uh, signal um, from climate in these systems. So really digging into that noise and thinking like systems ecologists. And I like to, uh, I use a little mantra playing on the words of one of our former presidents when I'm looking at my signal. It's the ecology, stupid. We're looking at the land surface. We want to see how things are changing. And so really embracing this ecological perspective is going to have huge opportunities in where we push time series remote sensing uh, in the future. And so in closing, when I think about my vision for desired future breakthroughs, I think about when I go grocery shopping at my local market. And I always see these little stickers on all the produce that say to be a local hero. And I take this to heart, not just in my grocery shopping, but also in my work as a remote sensing expert. Um, I've been living and working in New England for over a decade now, and this has really afforded me a lot of opportunities to look in detail at my particular system, a place-based perspective. And so, I'll pull up my maps here. So this tends to be my study area in cutting, covering Massachusetts. Um, we've gotten really good at national scale mapping. We've got LC map, we've got NLCD, we've got Matt Hansen's global change products. We know how to do 
really great work over large areas. So I think our desired future breakthroughs are really gonna to be to hone in on the local scale detail, to really get good at not just getting the big picture right, but also understanding the specifics of individual systems. And the way I see this playing out as not necessarily one person or one group taking on a huge study area, but a network of collaborators who know their systems really well and are able to use these larger scale products as a starting point to begin building in the local details that really matter and that make a place unique and, um, and different from other places. It's comparative ecology in a way. And so I'm gonna keep it short and sweet. In closing, I think our um, desired future breakthrough, the challenge that I'd like to put forward to especially the young career remote sensors here in the room is to when you're mapping, think global and map local. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Okay, Tom, where's the other ones? Our uh, third panelist is Dr. Justin Huntington from the universe, from Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada, where he's an assistant or associate research professor uh, in the Western Regional Climate Center uh, he has, Justin has a PhD in hydrology from the University of, Nebra uh, University of Nevada, Reno, uh, and has a rich uh, research focus on a variety of water resources issues, including drought, um, surface energy balance topics, and the interaction between surface water and groundwater. Uh, Justin, in addition to his research, plays an active service role. He was a co-investigator on the Landsat Science Team from 2012 through 2017, and he also serves on the, the Nevada Governor's Drought Commission. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, Justin. Thanks a lot, Tom, for the kind words and the introduction. <clears throat> so this image here, uh, I thought captured a lot of, of what we're dealing with out west. We have snow, we have mountains, forest, uh, desert, playa. There's a mine here, that, that pond of water, that's, a, that's a, uh, basically a big hole in the ground that was filled with water and now has a pH of about two. Um, and then of course we have agriculture. These are all big issues for us right now, especially with uh, new legislature and policies being in place. So issues facing our remote sensing community of practice from a drought and water perspective, some thoughts. First, navigating the flood of new information. Um, the PCORA 20 tagline, science for decisions. That's really hard uh, to get the science actually into the decision-making process. It's easy to say, it's really hard to do. We have a big bridge to cross there, um, and I think ARD is a great step forward. Um, but uh, with ARD, now people say, okay, well, what do I do with this analysis-ready data? How do I actually make a decision with it? So I think as a first step, we need to make it easy to go from archives to answers, uh, to actually get the answers into the decision-making process. Practitioners desperately need ways to efficiently get answers so that the science can be integrated. Um, and, and light science is okay. I was talking with, with Jess Brown at the bar last night and, and, and she said light science. I was like, that's a great term actually. Um, we're heavy scientists, uh, but the decision makers and the managers, they are okay with relying on the light science. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect to make a decision. Um, and I think that's a, there's a huge role for, for light science um, and, and how we improve uh, our science as heavy scientists to, to make uh, the heavy science eventually get into the decision making. Um, but as a first step, it's okay. Some new information is better than 60 year old or no information.
decision at all, which is basically where we're at in a lot of uh, management decisions now. Another thing facing our remote sensing community of practice, uh, stakeholder engagement. We just don't do enough of it. Um, Bill Workheiser, uh, USGS opening remark, uh, this scientist manager confusion issue. But I thought you needed, and but you told me you could. Alan Bellward in a session uh, talked about engaging end users early on in the process. This is so important. Engagement is a really key part of this information flood control for one. So we can tell uh, managers and stakeholders what's really important. Um, and also make sure they know what exists. Uh, oftentimes they don't even know that this stuff exists. So, you know, when I show them this 30 meter scale NDVI anomaly map, they're like, what, where did this come from? Landsat, what, how do I use this? Uh, how many times does it come back every year? <laughs> you know? um, and, and also, the stakeholder engagement is really important so, so that we know we are producing the right kind of information. So an example of this regional or the stakeholder engagement uh, and outreach, um, we hosted a national integrated drought information system workshop at BRI uh, this summer. And basically, we brought together water experts, ranchers, farmers, municipal water managers to facilitate dialogue and, and identify best practices for drought resistance, resilience, preparedness, management, and potential policy. And you know, these things are hard to commit a lot of time to, but they're so important as the lead scientist on a program or a project to engage and do this. And and it's it's hard uh, to 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 take time out of our busy schedules. And, and especially when the, the, you do these exercises like uh, thought map. I was like, what's thought map? This is pretty cool. And the question, we had these different questions. Uh, we, we broke out into groups and had different questions. And, and the question in our group was, when does dry become drought? And I was like, ah, that's a kind of a silly question. But that's, that's really interesting, actually. And we started talking about it. And, and one of the, and, and so you have to write down your answer and then you, and then you connect all the answers to, to each other and, and, and end, ends up they're all kind of interrelated. And some of the answers are pretty funny when the governor says so, when he actually declares a drought, then it's a drought. Um, when it starts to hurt, loss of production economics. Um, the USDM, a US Drought Monitor author, was in our group, and he said, when D0 becomes D1, go figure. <laughs> right? um, when public health becomes an issue, a uh, crop failure, crop failure risk. And, and one of my uh, suggestions was, well, it depends on the time scale that we're talking about, hydrologic versus vegetative type drought, and I'll, I'll touch on that next. Um, what came out of this meeting is a top priority was operationally tracking water use and drought with Landsat, place-based information, not just Landsat, but also place-based climate, and linking those two together. I'm, I'm really uh, encouraged by seeing talks and, and Val's statement about bringing in climate into this Landsat time series analysis. So from archives to answers, an example, I work a lot with FuseNet um, and FuseNet stakeholders, and they said, we need to be able to quickly process, visualize climate satellite data, land surface model data on demand, maps and time series, global field scales, custom time periods, dynamic and interactive interface, avoid downloading and processing entire archives to visualize a simple anomaly map, a Landsat scale. That sounds really simple, but it's really hard. We've got to process the whole archive to get a median and then difference from it. Um, Focus instead on interpretation and an efficient decision making, and just get over this bottleneck. Um, so here's an example of Ethiopia, a uh, small farming village, Gandhi, Ethiopia. And here's kind of a close up of it. Uh, and this is what you get with MODIS as an NDVI anomaly map. Um, this is what uh, we've been using uh, on FUSE um, and, and uh, you know, this is good at, at obviously at the regional scale, but that's what we want to see. We want to see the Landsat scale. And we want to see it in an interactive map viewer where you can have a transparency bar, zoom in, pan around, draw a box, get a time series. Um, 
So I'm happy to say Mac, uh, um, uh, Mac at uh, USGS Friedrich at uh, USGS Uros, um, Jim Rowland and, and, um, and others are over in Ethiopia right now and they asked Mac uh, last week, hey, we're going over to Ethiopia. Can you produce a map of the NDVI anomaly for me and some time series so I can take it out in the field? And, and I'm leaving in a couple of days. And, and they hopped on our web application um, and was able to create that map and, and time series and, and gave it to those guys. So that's what we're aiming for. Also, African field scientists are actually using this stuff um, where they don't have good connectivity. Here's an example of an NDVI anomaly map for Lovelock, Nevada, um, and this issue of time scale of drought. We're in a deep hydrologic drought, summer 2015. Um, no, uh, surface irrigation for this irrigation district at all that summer or that growing season. Um, but we had a lot of summer rain, and so the rangelands were doing great. We had boomer grasses, um, the, the, the cattle were really loving it, the ranchers were, uh, were wanting to get more cattle out there, and the BLM kicked them off the range because the USDM said D4. Um, so this is just kind of that, that, that that thing that we can, we can really complement and enhance the U.S. Drought Monitor by getting this place-based information out there. Um, here's this web application that I mentioned um, where basically we provide on-demand cloud computing and visualization of climate remote sensing data. And I'm not gonna focus on that in this talk, but I just wanted to mention that that's there. And, it, and, it, and we created it because of the stakeholder engagement and feedback. So it doesn't stop at engagement. The days of loading doc science are gone. This, this, hey, we need this product, here you go. Okay, on to the next, next research product, project. Um, we really need to train uh, and get these products into the hands of the decision makers, open sharing of codes and trainings on how to use the codes and web applications. It's great we have this web application, but people don't know how to use it. They're afraid of it. Uh, and so we really have to sit down with these folks. So this is an example of a, another workshop that we did at DRI uh, in the computer lab with, uh, with eight state water agencies, Western state water agencies. And these are crop inventory staff, GIS specialists, pumpage inventory folks um, that aren't remote sensing specialists. But we spent four days training them on how to use ETMOP. And, and actually getting these codes into their shop so they can produce this stuff internally. And within two weeks, uh, my colleague Jordan Beamer at Oregon Water Resource Department created this metric-based seasonal ET map for Malheur Lake Basin, Southeast Oregon, which is a severely overdrafted basin, and took this map to the farmers out in the field and said, what do you guys think, and shared the data with them. And so now they're comparing against their pump which is, a, I think, a phenomenal success story. Emerging opportunities, open source projects, not just to share codes or to be consumed by companies, but to have community contribute back to the project, back to the open source project so that the project benefits from outside knowledge. And a great example of this is the GDAO open source project, Jupyter and IPython notebooks. Um, for Landsat data to be fused with other platforms and be combined with climate data. Um, Landsat, I believe strongly, holds the key to future water management. You can't manage what you don't measure, and right now we aren't measuring groundwater pump um, or surface water diversions. And, and really, we want to know what's being consumed into the atmosphere, not what's necessarily being applied, um, because some of that applied water goes back to the source. Um, this is really important right now with groundwater management and in California, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Everybody needs to know the consumptive use um, and uh, there's just a really big focus on ET right now. Free implants, monitoring management and mitigation plans, any big groundwater exportation project in Nevada and Western states in general requires this, especially for monitoring environmental uh, areas like groundwater dependent ecosystems. And Landsat can be used to set that baseline. How has vegetation changed in the past with climate? And that is your baseline relationship. And if you go below, say, 
water year precip regressed with NDVI with some prediction intervals around it. If you go below some threshold, then you set triggers or you set the trigger. So, so these relationships are actually being used. Landsat is being used to set trigger levels. Cloud computing for light and heavy science applications. Um, a great example, uh, a friend of mine at the BLM, he's a rangeland scientist, never had formal training in remote sensing. Um, he's now creating 30-year interannual NDVI time series and anomaly maps, taking these maps and time series into the field while he's doing field assessments to know where we've been in the past and how it compares to current conditions. Landsat-based global water use mapping, it's really hard. Um, we're getting there. Latent heat flux, or ET, latent means hidden. It's the hidden piece, the water, energy, and carbon cycle. It is the link between these things. It is the link between the water and energy and carbon budget, it is latent energy, it is the ET. So emerging opportunities, really connecting ET change with climate and land use change at the field scale, like Val mentioned. Um, let's really focus on that field scale, that local scale, and also the basin scale. So here's a, an example collaboration with Gabriel Sine and Mackenzie Friedrich um, and others at Eros where um, we're now producing um, uh, ET maps at very large scales. And also collaborating with Martha Anderson and others on getting uh, ESI into a really nice web application viewer um, where we can uh, pan around and zoom and really start to interrogate the data. So desired future breakthroughs, uh, ensemble water use mapping to better understand model differences in covariates in space and time. Climate models, hydrologic models, land cover land use. There's a lot of folks uh, disciplines making ensembles. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that too. And we can now, I believe. Um, multi, um, multiple ET groups uh, to contribute to an open source ET project. We're calling it Open ET. The goal is to advance the science and provide end users with free and low cost ET data via state of the art web application. So people can actually go get this information, uh, like folks dealing with Sigma. Um, local groundwater sustainability agencies and get the answers they need. So in summary, Landsat Archive fused with other platforms and climate data is key for future Western water management, I believe, um, as well as drought monitoring. Let's help folks move from archives to answers so that we can go from science to decisions. Uh, let's get out of the office and talk to folks that actually go in the field and manage land, water, and agriculture. And as scientists, uh, that are running big programs and teaching. That's really hard for us to do, but I think it's so important because it, it really grounds you um, in what's really important. The vision, Landsat for large-scale water management, Sigma, uh, open source projects, community contributions, co-production knowledge. It's not a one-way street. Uh, work with the ET community to develop an open ET project. And then finally, use this Landsat uh, information, especially latent heat flux, i.e. ET, to better understand the hidden linkages between the global water and budgets. So a little plug here, um, in a couple of weeks, the new BAMS uh, issue is going to come out. And I'm very humbled to say that we've, we've made the cover. Um, and also, none of this stuff would be possible without our, our uh, collaborators and, and funders. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Justin, and uh, your inspiring photo at the end uh, is a wonderful reminder of what's ahead. Our fourth panelist uh, is Dr. John Gammon from the University of Nebraska. Uh, and the University of Alberta as well, it says. Uh, John has a, a PhD in uh, botany from UC uh, Davis, uh, and his research emphasis, uh, as he has expressed it, is um, 
uh, understanding, studying the breathing planet. And in that capacity, he's looking at the exchanges of carbon and water vapor, their interactions between the biosphere and atmosphere, and their effects on ecosystem um, productivity and the roles they play in regulating atmosphere and climate. And so, John, it's a pleasure to have you here. Okay, I've been instructed to get close to the mic. Well, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's great being here and seeing what, what's, what happens in this world. This is a little different world from the one I come from. I'm a plant ecophysiologist by training. So that's where I'm coming from in some of my remarks. And I wanted to start with this picture of a rainbow over a black spruce forest in Alberta for a couple reasons. One is your eye looks very even. You don't see a lot of pattern biodiversity and there's not a lot of dynamics obvious in this, but there's a lot that's going on. And if we use the colors of light, uh, uh, illustrated by the rainbow, we can see a lot, a lot that our eyes can't even see. And so um, that's kind of the theme that I'm pulling on. I want to talk about what we get by digging into that spectral dimension of um, remote sensing. And the two applications, breakthroughs, if you will, or challenges that I wanted to talk about are photosynthetic phenology, something that's a process that's essentially invisible. You can't see a spruce tree breathing, but it has a huge impact on the global carbon cycle. Um, so we get at that a couple ways through pigment dynamics, uh, through solar induced fluorescence. Those are some new breakthroughs. Um, there are also challenges. Uh, and then the other topic, the second topic I'd wanted to touch on was assessing biodiversity uh, through plant traits, through using optical diversity, spectral properties. And another important message is a lot of this happens, this work happens at many different scales. So we're not just talking about satellite data, but a whole range of different measurements from satellites to aircraft to drones to proximal measurements on the ground. And of course, in terms of biological processes, the ones I mentioned, uh, you know, photosynthesis or plant traits or biodiversity, what we detect at these different scales will be rather different. And one of the take home messages is we really do have to think across scales and build that into what we do. It's not all going to be done from satellite, although the satellites obviously are very helpful and very powerful. And in my case, the first example I want to relate these optical measurements to the invisible fluxes, uh, and the example will be in evergreen forests. The other dimensional or scaling slide I wanted to show was, was this one, as you know, there's many different sensors out there with different bands and there is this tendency over time to add bands or to go towards a more hyperspectral sensor. We don't have a true hyperspectral satellite up there right now, but you know, we do have airborne sensors like the Avaris one in the bottom right with tremendous spectral detail. And there's a lot on the horizon that might happen. But a lot of the work in this area is happening at all these different scales because that's where we have access to the data. So lots of breakthroughs happening in a lot of different ways. So a little bit of background, MODIS over terrestrial regions, that's one of the flagship biospheric monitoring satellites out there. It has relatively few land bands. Of course, we can use these for something like NDVI. Um, very useful. Um, with Collection 6, we now have all the ocean bands available over land. And this isn't quite a hyperspectral satellite, but we're moving in that direction. So the question I want to pose is what, what do we gain by adding a few bands or even just one band? If you take MODIS band one for the NDVI and add a single ocean band, band, band 11, what can we add to our understanding of photosynthetic activity and phenology, for example? And I have to say, you know, I thought when MODIS was going to go up, we'd have access to all these bands. It took 15 years to get there, to get access to, you know, to get collection six. And I want to thank the folks at NASA, Alexei Lyapustin, uh, Fred Humrich, who's worked hard to get these bands available, and NASA in general for now making these bands routinely available on collection six. So what can we get by these two bands? Um, well, one of the things we can get is we can get at the phenology of something invisible, the 
photosynthetic activity of an evergreen tree that doesn't respond to in terms of NDVI. Uh, if you look at evergreens in winter, I don't know how many of you have noticed this, they do t turn color slightly. Uh, they turn a little yellow green in the winter, they turn brighter green in the summer. NDVI doesn't really pick that up very well. But what's happening is shown in the cartoon on the left is the pigment pools are changing in subtle ways. The carotenoid pool, the yellow pigments is building up, that's a photoprotective pool, and the chlorophyll pool is shrinking. And they actually physically change, the ultrastructure changes within the leaf. And this is something that's been known in plant physiology for many years, but it hasn't really entered into remote sensing until recently. Um, when the plants can't do photosynthesis because it's too cold, the biochemistry doesn't work. They protect themselves by separating and building up this photoprotective pool. What happens that there's a spectral change associated with that shown here. These are pine needles in winter and summer or a canopy of a pine tree. And these two bands happen to be able to detect this pigment shift rather well. And um, there's nothing magic about these bands. It's just that they happen to be placed in a place where they can catch this phenomenon that previously has been hard to get at, um, at least with MODIS. So a recent index, chlorophyll carotenoid index, captures this using these two bands, basically a normalized difference index of these two bands. And if you look at what that can do, if you compare remote sensing from satellite from MODIS collection six in the, in the red color to um, what a flux tower sees, measuring the fluxes or the gas exchange between ecosystems in the atmosphere. Um, so the flux in black and the indices from MODIS in red. And you see on the left is the chlorophyll carotenoid index, on the right is NDVI. Let's look at NDVI first for three canopies. These are evergreen canopies in Maine, a spruce canopy on the top, loblolly pine in North Carolina, and then on the bottom, Wind River, Washington, Douglas fir, and hemlock canopies. And you'll see the NDVI doesn't equally capture, and in some cases doesn't capture at all, the dynamics of the actual fluxes, which is the black line. But if you look at the chlorophyll carotenoid index, the pigments, what the pigments are actually doing, they're revealing the activity of photosynthesis through the seasons. Um, so I think by going a little further, even just a tiny bit further, we can start to open our eyes to invisible things, dynamics of photosynthesis, for example, in evergreen trees. So digging into spectral detail a little more, what can you see? Well, t totally by accident, as many of you know, there's several satellites up there that were designed uh, to do atmospheric measurements of carbon dioxide, a really important topic. Well, one of the annoying things, I want to talk about accidental discoveries a little bit. A lot of you know, what happens in terms of breakthroughs, we don't plan any of this. It just happens. Uh, so the annoying thing in these little absorption bands, these blue features, these dips in the solar spectrum, are due to atmospheric absorption and solar absorption in the solar atmosphere of various things that we can only see with very high resolution spectrometers. So you go to a super high resolution spectrometer like you have on GOSAT or GOMED or OCO2, and you can see in these little wells where there's absorption of the solar spectrum, you see little tiny pieces of the red spectrum, which is the fluorescence from plant pigments from chlorophyll. And it turns out that uh, people started looking at this in recent years and um, started producing global maps of solar-induced fluorescence. Here's an example from a paper by Christian Frankenberg. And you can see the spatial patterns, the seasonal dynamics on the upper right. And on the bottom left is a figure showing the relationship between solar-induced fluorescence, or F sub S, and global primary production from upscaled carbon flux towers. So this completely accidental thing, a satellite that was designed for something else, is actually very good at measuring GPP, here aggregated over the whole world. And I've thought a lot about this figure. It looks fantastic. It's really the best thing out there, maybe. But then I went back to an old figure by um, Goward and Dye, Sam Goward's paper, 1980-something. And they showed a relationship between NDVI and GPP, which was every bit as good as this. So you have this question of scale. And when you aggregate, what are you, are you really advancing the field? Is this really a breakthrough? I would argue it is, because we're getting close to a different aspect of photosynthesis, a functional aspect. So we can do functional mapping in a different way. 
And one of the things that's rather interesting is the chlorophyll carotenoid signal, the pigment signal, happens to be very closely related to what the fluorescence signal is doing in boreal forest bees, trees. That's what the bottom right-hand figure shows. You'll also see slight differences in different species. And so we've got a lot of work to do. This is a challenge, but it's also a breakthrough in our understanding of how we can detect photosynthesis using a couple different ways, uh, an invisible process with remote sensing. So the way I like to think of this is the Russian dolls. You guys know these, right? OK, so we've got like the big obvious things, big bands like NDVI. Maybe we can detect chlorophyll or some surrogate of chlorophyll. If you dig in a little deeper, open up that doll, get into the spectral domain, you can start to see other pigments, like the carotenoid pools, these regulatory pools, um, ants and accessory pigments. And if you dig into that, you can start to get to tinier signals, like the fluorescence signal, xanthophyll cycle, other kinds of regulatory things. So we have layer upon layer upon layer of information. And by thinking about how we measure across scales, with uh, finer and finer instruments, we can get deeper and deeper into hidden processes, the actual regulatory processes of photosynthesis. Um, so I would argue this is a breakthrough. Uh, it is fu functionally different from what we've been doing. So um, the second example I wanted to talk about briefly was biodiversity. As you know, we're losing biodiversity. It's hugely important for maintaining ecosystem function including the carbon cycle. The productivity of our, of our planet depends to a large extent on maintaining the diversity of things. And uh, the resilience of ecosystems is really related to this. So this is a figure on the left showing you um, how many different species there are for different latitudes. And you see they tend to peak towards the tropics. And uh, in the, the white bars on the bottom of that figure show you the species where we actually have information about plant traits. And you can see we, we have to go a long ways towards sampling. You know, we barely touched on our understanding of a lot of the diversity out there in the world. So there's a lot that we don't know. And the hope that the idea of this figure in this article is that remote sensing is really the breakthrough technology that is going to help us with this problem. And, and the figure on the right from a paper by Dave Schimmel shows that as you add spectral bands, your power to detect traits, plant traits, the information in spectra that relates to plant traits, just from a purely information content standpoint, goes up. And so if we're operating on the left side of this, uh, if we could move a little more to the right, our power to detect things related to functional plant traits that are important for biodiversity and also ecosystem function goes way up. So I'm going to skip over that just to keep it short. And um, so there's some really interesting things happening right now in, in my world where plant ecology meets remote sensing. And I'm not sure this is plant ecology or remote sensing. Neither group is happy with this entirely because it's new uh, and it's happening and people don't fully understand it. What we're really talking about is the joining of two fields. Like in this figure, for example, how do plant traits on the right having to do with leaf structure, leaf biochemistry, or plant structure, plant traits at different scales that result in different spectral features that we can see with instruments. Very subtle differences, invisible with broad bands, but detectable with narrow hyperspectral approaches. Very subtle differences. How do they relate to biodiversity, species diversity, functional diversity, and phylogenetic diversity, and even hidden things like below ground diversity, things we can't see. The, the central theme here is surrogacy. Uh, optical measurements are a proxy for things. And these things are latent variables that we still don't fully understand related to plant function and biodiversity. So something crazy like this figure where um, relating phylogeny, the evolutionary history of plants in the genes to what we see with spectral features, two sequences. An interesting statistical problem. How do you relate these? But when you do, you can make, you can find significant relationships and find significant connections between spectral patterns of, of different species and their phylogenetic history. Something very, very new. We don't know where this is going to take us, but this is the level of information people are exploring now uh, with spectra and uh, molecular methods. 
So another example, uh, or another aspect of this work, and a lot of this work, this particular example comes from Cedar Creek, a prairie site. Plants are very small, so what can you really detect in terms of diversity? Uh, alpha diversity, the plot level diversity, or is it more something at a higher scale like beta diversity, larger landscape level diversity, or between site diversity? Well, that's being explored with multi-scale experiments, actual experiments with all these technologies from the ground, the drones, to the airplanes, to the satellites, to look at where can, what's the sweet spot for finding these, these hidden variables? Uh, and are we really talking about alpha diversity, alpha spectral diversity, an analog for what biologists call alpha diversity or beta diversity? Just what are we talking about? Because these, these, there's all these different definitions that are starting to converge in this interesting world. So um, I would propose that this is an area where we're going to make tremendous breakthroughs. How it's going to happen, I'm not really sure, because it's happening. It's, it's work in progress going on with lots of different types of measurements on the ground, in the air, and from satellite. Uh, so how do we turn this into challenges and opportunities? Uh, these breakthrough areas are also challenges and opportunities. There's this tremendous power of spectral information to look at things like photosynthesis and invisible process, biodiversity at a scale that we can't really see with our eyes using latent variables. Uh, plant traits uh, that are functional but also related to phylogeny and diversity. Um, huge power, but also a challenge. Uh, we don't have a satellite, that's a challenge. Um, handling the information, that's a huge challenge. So this, you know, the other part of this is the integration across scales and also disciplines. People have to work together, and I think that's a huge opportunity. This is where a lot of the breakthroughs are coming, uh, but it's also very, very hard to do. We have to uh, cross these different disciplinary uh, boundaries. and. Um, Obviously, huge informatics needs. It turns out there, you know, we've talked a lot about the wonderful availability of satellite data. Most of the stuff I'm showing you, there isn't really an archive where you can find this stuff or put this stuff. However, we're starting to make some progress. LPDAC has offered to help us with some of our image data from biodiversity research. We couldn't find an archive to take it. Huge data sets, but there's no place for it because all the existing archives can't do it. So how do we get this stuff? to the point of what we've been talking about at this meeting of getting it in the cloud so we can really make these things move forward. So these are the thoughts I wanted to leave you with, and thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to invite the, uh, the panelists to uh, come back. <clears throat> And my suggestion is sit on this side. Um, Dr. Lari unfortunately had to catch a flight, and so he will not be participating in the discussion. Um, so what we'd like to do now is open this up to um, discussion and uh, to make sure everybody can hear. Uh, we will wander around with a microphone to make sure that uh, we all understand and hear your questions. So would anybody like to propose a topic for discussion? Well, let me um, suggest, a, a, would you find one? Sure, way over there. Uh, yeah, my my question would be more, uh, well, definitely relevant in the last talk, but uh, getting getting to this, because I, I work with at the Biological Survey in Kansas and deal with a lot of ecologists and biologists as well. And uh, what, what are the thoughts on information we have available that just hasn't been mined out yet versus what are we missing that needs to come with newer sensors or technologies? Panelists, would somebody like to? Uh... That's, that's a tough question. Um, sort of, to some extent, your question implies that we don't know where all this is. But I think um, there's an awful lot that we do know about that's just not very accessible. Um, 
I don't know if this is answering your question. Can you move closer to the mic? Yeah, I don't know if this is quite answering your question, but you know, what I see as the problem is, is getting a lot of ecological data into a form that is accessible and useful. And there's a lot of people working on that, but it's a very difficult problem. It involves a lot of effort, a lot of work, and changing the culture of how we do things. And uh, it's, it's a much harder problem than I think getting the data from a satellite into into a system because the data, every every approach, every experiment, every instrument is a little different. And that information has to be captured. So it's a, to some extent, it's a metadata problem. Um, so uh, I think to me, that's one of the huge challenges is figuring out ways of addressing your question to the extent I understand it. And I'm not sure I have any magic answers for that, but um, I think it's a really hard problem of. Uh, finding the data and getting access to the data uh, to, to address questions in ecology. Power? So I'll try and answer this from the Lancet Time Series perspective, which is what I tend to take. But I think there's a lot of information content in there that can be mined that has been attempted in the past. And in a lot of my work, I end up revisiting problems that maybe somebody tackled 20, 30 years ago, things like trying to map species composition, or I've done work on gypsy moth defoliation, things that are now in our dense temporal data. And so as Landsat data becomes easier to access and use through ARD and other products, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities, not necessarily to um, come up with new ideas, but to circle back to things that we've tried before and do them even better, come up with more accurate maps and fill those gaps that managers are noticing. I work a lot with um, kind of local scale folks who they have a product, it's out there, but it's not quite meeting their needs yet. And a lot of my work is trying to go back and, and fill those gaps from the temporal perspective. We've been dabbling in um, the ecology side of things as of late, uh, specifically groundwater dependent ecosystems. And, and uh, um, out west, when you, when you pump, well, this is true anywhere, but especially out west with respect to groundwater dependent ecosystems and the, and the and increased focus on it. Um, and, and not a lot of people want to really admit that when you pump groundwater, it comes from somewhere else. There's this thing called mm -hmm. conservation of mass. And, and that, that come, coming from somewhere else, it, it usually comes either from surface water or you're capturing ET from plants. And so there's this big question on what is, what, what is, uh, where, where are there, adverse impacts. What are adverse impacts when we lower the water table and the phreatophytes don't have that water table to survive anymore and they may be facultative phreatophytes or obligate. Um, what happens? And we have a whole history. I mean, we've been pumping groundwater for 70 years in the Great Basin plus. And, and so um, we've been using the Landsat Archive to, for example, make uh, trend maps in NDVI and fitting like a man Kindle trend test and, and making a slope map and, and a p-value map so we can see where the significant trends are. And then we go out in the field and we, we bring other data into this investigation like groundwater levels um, to, to really get a good understanding on, well, what are the impacts when you lower the water table by 20 feet? And we go out and take pictures. But Without that map in hand, you don't know where to go drive. I mean, these basins are hundreds of miles long by 70 miles long, and you just don't know. So I think, I think pairing other information now with, with products that we can develop with the Landsat Archive is really important, like groundwater levels, precipitation, um, other covariates that we really haven't been using uh, in the past. And now with Sentinel uh, and Landsat Fusion, Boy, with three-day return times, that's going to be really, really exciting. And, and in terms of sensors, I think thermal data, increased use of thermal data to look at ecosystem stress is something that really hasn't been. Thanks. Uh, other questions or comments? Uh, yes, Jess. So I'll follow with um, 
what Dustin was just saying, and maybe it's a question back to each of you, if you could wave your magic wand today, um, you know, related to remote sensing, but you know, what would you wish for? What would you want handed to you? Oh boy, that's tough. Um, uh, daily Landsat returns <laughs> with thermal and super spectral. Um, not not necessarily hyper, but you know, a couple more bands would be nice. And um, other other comments. Well, I'd like a hyper spectral satellite. Um, and the other thing I'd like is an easy way to get the wide range of data from that I think the last question sort of alluded to into a usable format that so that preserves it and allows it to be reused. Uh, the, I'd, I'd like a solution to that problem for a whole range of So those are a couple of things that come to mind. I guess I would, I would second both of those. I would love to have more frequent Landsat observations. I'd love to see uh, some new spectral bands, uh, more information to use. I'd also like to see us continue to push forward on visualization. We have some great tools that we work with, but I'd like to see those more broadly available, more types of visualizations, getting the data so that it makes it easier to share with the people who are using it um, on the other end so that they can understand when we say a time series or we say, hyperspectral information, what that looks like and how we can better communicate that. That way we're in better partnership with the folks who are using it, not just handing them products, but helping them understand where they come from. So I'd like to see lots of development on kind of the user accessibility side of things. Thanks. Yes, sir. John, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but maybe I will. <laughs> anyway, um, how frequently do we need hyperspectral data? Do you have any sense of that? I've been, I've been curious about that. It probably depends on the question. Um, I think the people who've looked at that issue, and not a lot of people have looked at it, um, suggest that it, the more you look at it, the more interesting it becomes. So take plant traits, for example, it's almost always collected in the middle of the growing season. Maybe you have one flight or you have one field data collection where you go out and collect spectra and you're trying to derive information on your entire study from that. Uh, well, when you look at different seasons, it's, it opens your eyes to the dynamics of that. So uh, because we don't have the data, it's very hard to get the data. We don't know the answer to that. But the few studies that have looked at it say that it's really important, even for something that we think of as a static thing like plant traits. It's not static at all. Uh, functional processes change constantly. Um, so, uh, you know, what I'm having fun with right now is the MODIS Collection 6. It's, it's really multiple times a day in northern latitudes you, you get information. So it's not the 16-day composite. It's just all the raw data. And from that, you can sort of explore that time area and also putting instruments out and letting them run automatically is another way to look at that. So um, I think that's, a, that's something we don't really have the answer to yet. But yeah, hidden time series of all kinds of things are really important, I think. Thank you. I was surprised that none of you mentioned the spatial resolution, they only mentioned the temporal, like the would be better to have a higher sp higher temporal resolution, but for my work as like plant ecologist, like you, not physiologist, but ecologist, I really miss the spatial, re high spatial resolution data on like the daily basis or freely available basis. And I think when you, when you look at the, like the vegetation patterns in, in diverse landscape, in heterogeneous landscape, then you really, have to get into more detail to tackle out the processes. It's too coarse, the resolution of Landsat or Moldis, too coarse to, to, even for the plant traits, I would say it's very, very coarse resolution. Yeah, if I can respond to that, I agree with you entirely. And I didn't mean to not mention spatial, it was conveyed in that first diagram, because it's hugely important. Um, 
and what I didn't say is, is the dependency, our ability to detect plant traits and um, the issue of biodiversity, it's completely dependent on spatial resolution and how you see that is very strongly affected by spatial resolution. Um, that's something, that's the dirty little secret that nobody talks about. Uh, you're not gonna see alpha diversity from satellite, global satellite pixels as we think of them now uh, with um, Landsat, for example, except perhaps in some cases. And these are ecosystem dependent. The spatial dependence of this depends on what kind of ecosystem. A, a prairie or an Arctic ecosystem is very different from the tropical rainforest. So until we have the data at all these scales and can measure optical processes at all these scales, the remote sensing analog to your question, I think, or answer to that is, is going to be slightly missing. So um, I think that's a huge challenge is to characterize things at all those different scales. So I think we're going to have to try to sample some things and, and do some modeling and do some other kinds of ways to understand that problem. So I think we all know there's, there's always trade-offs as well. And so I guess I think a lot about the temporal domain because I like to have high frequency of observations in order to look at change dynamics. Um, I tend to look at the higher spatial resolution imagery as opportunities for validation, for really checking what's on the, land set, on the landscape. And there should be a sweet spot in there where we can start to get slightly higher resolution that'll help us look at things like crop fields and urban areas, uh, places that you do have a really heterogeneous landscape. But when you get too small of pixels, now you've got so much variability in your signal that it's much harder to process and even to store in data sizes. So I guess my, my tendency is to go towards the temporal because I'm interested in dynamics, but I definitely agree that there is a need for slightly higher spatial resolution. Sentinel's great for that, um, as well as maybe more frequent of the very high resolution, more from the validation and, and ground truthing perspective. We have time for one more question, if uh, there is such. Adam? Thanks, Tom. Thank you for very three four very interesting talks. Um, you've all actually said that you're sort of on the brink of a, a mecca in terms of information and, and exploration of those data sets. And I just wonder if, if people aren't the limiting factor going forward. And I, certainly that's what I see in my part of the world. And I just wondered if what your views were on that. That is students and, and others to actually undertake the studies to investigate these incredibly interesting questions and, and take them forward. So I definitely touched on that in my presentation, and I think it's definitely a limiting factor. We have a lot of work to do in how we are training our next generation remote sensing scientists, making sure that they have uh, the programming school skills, the data management skills, and then the topical expertise that they're going to need to answer some really interesting questions. And so I'd like to see as a community that we come together more and start sharing what's working for us, what's not. America View actually had a session on this with lessons learned from uh, their experience working. I went to the one more on the undergrad side of it, but I understand there was a case through 12 as well, but we're all out there teaching students how to do remote sensing, and I'd love to see more collaboration, more sharing of materials, more access to materials. Uh, that would help everyone do a better job training the next generation because, yes, we do need better training and more students capable of doing the things and exploring the patterns that are out there in the data that we just don't all have time to get to. I totally agree with that. and, and um it is a people problem, I think, now. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, it was a compute problem, and now we have the cloud, and, and, um, and that's moving forward. Um, from a, from a decision-making perspective or, you know, the end-user perspective, a lot of these agencies, they just don't have the staff to deal with all this information. They might have one um, hydrologist that deals with water consumption uh, inventories. And now we're asking these agencies to commit a quarter time FTE just to deal with our remote sensing. And, and luckily, and, and very thankfully, Brad uh, Dorn with NASA um, has helped us through funding to engage these water agencies. And, and, and we got commitment from the water agencies 
to actually provide in-kind support, uh, half to quarter-time FTE to just work on this, but one person isn't enough. Uh, two people, you know, Idaho Department of Water Resources, they have three people just digitizing field boundaries so they can spatially average their ET maps to the field boundaries to calculate volumes. Um, and it's a big challenge getting enough people to actually do something with our science now. Um, and, and on the academic side, yeah, the, the programming and also the science. We want to hire somebody to help us. Who do we hire? Do we hire a computer scientist or do we hire uh, a hydrologist, a remote sensing person? Um, it, it's really hard to find the skills uh, that are needed that, that cross this big spectrum of programming and science. Yeah, interesting question. Um, and I think um, if we use the kinds of things that, that we talk about here at this meeting, and if, if those things fragment us and separate our disciplines, uh, it's a problem. But if we can use the cloud and these technologies to, to do what your question implies, I think that's a different outcome and a much better outcome, an essential outcome. So it's an important question. Um, personally, I like uh, the CS plus X approach. Um, that's something that I think academics can do in our training. I like the stakeholder outreach that you mentioned. These are things that we should all be thinking about. But you know, uh, how do we reintegrate the disciplines? We're very good at fragmenting the disciplines. And, and I think we, we can't afford to do that anymore. Thank you. Um, I, we're to the end of the session. I want to just make a couple of observations before we uh, break up. The point of this session was to explore scientific and technical issues that are, uh, that are emerging or are opportunities or challenges. And I, I think the diversity of perspectives uh, address that quite well. But what really strikes uh, as a common theme through all of these that I, I didn't really expect was one, the discussion we just had on the importance of people and the skills they'll need in the future. Another one is the importance of remote sensing as a public service, the responsibilities we have not only to do good work, but to uh, serve as extension agents to get our work used um, for the benefit of society. And the final one, which also came through in all the presentations, was the importance of that local to global continuum. You know, the old saying in, in land cover mapping is you have to be globally consistent and locally relevant, and you all really hit that well. So thank you so much for your perspectives. Thank you for uh, serving on the final plenary of PCORA 20, and let's give them all a big hand. Okay, this, uh, we got our coffee break right now, and then we have five concurrent technical sessions, not six in this last. And so there are five outstanding technical sessions, so let's, let's fill the rooms up and we'll have, have some coffee. <laughs>